Dear audience, welcome to this Power Chat. In today's episode, we are discussing about post-conflict development strategies in South Asia with particular focus in education initiatives. Joining us today is Mr. Rajiv Vijay Shinga, former State Minister of Higher Education in Sri Lanka. He is a seasoned writer, political analyst and academician. Please allow me to welcome him. Welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Vijay Shinga. Thank you very much for having me. It's How have you been? It's been a nice time in Nepal. I was in Kathmandu, but also visited some of your re remote areas for educational projects. Very interesting. Well, uh, you served in many uh, capacities uh, with the university for a long time. You have been teaching English language. Then you served as a coordinator for you know looking after the PC stuff in Sri Lanka. You are a writer and political analyst as well. How would you see the reflections for development in South Asia um, with its reference to conflict? Well, if I can take Sri Lanka as an example, there was a very good development strategy in Sri Lanka after the conflict. And I think we can be very proud of what I would call physical development because conflict-torn areas where the infrastructure had been destroyed and some areas where the infrastructure had not existed before, you know, the rural districts in the north and in the east, very poor, they got roads, electricity, even better irrigation than before. But I think one of the problems that uh, the previous government, the government of President Mahindra Rajapaksa faced, was that it was development with insufficient attention to human resources development and insufficient consultation. And I think one of the most important aspects of development should be the involvement of people in development. You know, we did not have enough processes to involve what we call our local councils, Pradesha Sabhas. And I must say I was quite impressed with what you all have started in Nepal, whether it's successful or not, I don't know yet. We have given a lot of power to the municipalities in areas like education and health, uh, because those are not problems that can be solved by a central government. They're not even problems that can be solved by a provincial government. And I think we have a tendency in our countries to give more power to politicians. So we have several layers of government which overlap. Uh, but what we should be doing is giving power to the people. And for that you need small units. And that aspect of development, we didn't do well enough on. Well, what are the key learnings uh, from Sri Lanka that can be some other way reflected here in Nepal, especially addressing the development at the time of post-conflict? Well, I think the first thing is much more consultation with the supposed beneficiaries of development. But going hand in hand with that must be education, because you must develop your human resources. Now, if you actually set up uh, municipalities, if you set up what we call divisional units which look at education, the people there must also have the capacity to look at the issues, to look at them in terms of understanding the world at large and other issues as well. So, you know, when uh, under Rajapaksa government I was asked to advise on the new Local Government Act, and uh, previously we had no process of mandatory consultation. This had it, but the committees were set up by the chairman. And what I suggested was that you must involve rural development societies, in particular women's rural development societies, because the women are in a sense a key to development. You know, if you have educated women, you will not have to worry too much for the future. So those areas need strengthening. And I think a radical revision of education curricula, I was discussing it in fact uh, in my last morning in Nepal, I was discussing it with people involved in vocational training and the need to make your curriculum creative so that the people who follow that curriculum not only learn but also learn to think and learn to act. Well, this is much talked issue here in Nepal or Sri Lanka or other post-conflict situations. Leaders or politicians talk about participation, inclusion, 
addressing the aspirations of the you know sufferers of the conflict but do you think that really happens in the real change very rarely because leaders are not happy to give up power so the structural changes that are needed to actually set up uh, the, the 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 victims and therefore the presumed beneficiaries of your interventions giving them the power to recommend and make decisions is very rarely given up by the politicians you know i give you a very simple example when uh, the previous government was working post conflict and you know i go back to that sri lanka is very grateful to president mahinda rajapaksa for stopping the war you know we were living in a state of terror and i think like in nepal everyone welcomed the cessation of hostilities in sri lanka uh, unlike in nepal where you had an inclusive process after many efforts to negotiate with the tigers they proved intransigent because they wanted absolute power i mean uh, mahinda rajapaksha played good role so- i think he was magnificent during the war he tried to talk to the tigers they withdrew from peace talks three times and then finally he said look i can't be waiting i have to make sure that terrorism is eradicated from sri lanka and during the war he engaged in a lot of consultation with other tamil parties but after the war the development of the north was left to the central government with insufficient involvement of the other tamil parties that had not supported the tigers and for instance they had divisional committees chaired by politicians in colombo who were very unpopular and sometimes didn't go there so the committees never met and i think that is where he should have really engaged in more serious consultation but uh, mr uh, vijayashan there is criticism not only in sri lanka the other part of you know uh, world here in nepal as well the aspirations of survivors are not addressed there is large scale impunity that state is unable to address with what you have to say i i i fully agree i mean i think a lot of the stories are exaggerated but the simple method of dealing with that which rajapaksa pledged to do was to set up a commission to look into these he set it up too late and then its recommendations were not followed immediately you see i think what some of his advisers felt well if you develop the place people will be happy but uh, i fully agree with you that you know when i was advise on, re- uh, recon- on reconciliation i prepared a a uh, uh, reconciliation policy in which i talked about the need for restorative justice not retributive justice you know we are not here to point fingers you know during times of war things happen that shouldn't you must find out the truth but not to punish it is to console and satisfy the victims and that's why we call it restorative justice but uh, i'm afraid my my uh, policy recommendations were not taken seriously partly because i think the assumption was if we give them development prosperity and all that all these problems will go away that's not the way the world works people are sensitive they want their needs addressed so there should have been more co- more commissions he appointed some but too late to go into these questions there should have been um, for instance we had a very good tamil government agent in vaunia she set in place a system to trace missing people that should have been replicated on a large scale the un was willing to help us with it the icrc but none of those were taken seriously one reason i feel sorry though for mahinda rajapaksa is that from the very start he felt the west was determined to get him you know i told him once there are few very simple measures you can take to stop all this criticism and he said to me sadly and i think he meant it he said you know whatever i do they'll hate me and you see one of the biggest problems we have is the absolute hypocrisy of the west you know when it comes to their battles against terror they can do anything they like and no questions to be asked when it comes to our battles against terror partly because people in the west are financing some of these terrorists well uh, mr we need to be discussing i'm coming back to you on uh, the neighboring or west or east influence yeah. in the internal politics at the beginning you were referring to you know Uh, the physical infrastructures and physical development infrastructure development in sri lanka what are the key messages during i think it's already 10 years that you know sri lanka enjoys no more enjoys conflict yeah 
is in post conflict situation what are the key learnings during these all 10 years could you mention or highlight about the infrastructural uh, development that happened in sri lanka nepal could also learn with well i think one important thing that the rajapaksa government did, did was roads and electricity so that the physical facilities irrigation for economic development were in place but it said it did not do the human aspect when a lot of construction of houses and so on there wasn't enough participation of the people you know people should have been asked to design their houses it should have been through grants the indian government actually gave a lot of support for housing but initially it was all through ngos and the un and a lot of money was wasted a lot of i i, I would actually say there was sort of corruption in some of those deals then the government realized this and there was a new method where loans were given corruption by government or the agencies you are the agencies to. which would have involved individuals in government as well you know there was something called un ops which i used to find deeply corrupt un you know, ops ops it's one of the new agencies you know they were just willing to throw money around i'm sure commissions were involved but you know sri lankan officials as well but the indians then discovered to late a system whereby you gave grants to people they built their houses once they built a certain extent you went further and there was much more satisfaction about that so i think there are, you have to have infrastructure development not the roads and the electricity but things affecting people like houses like uh, the other thing that wasn't done enough of was loans to reintegrate you know former combatants were rehabilitated it was good but there wasn't a provision to reintegrate them through entrepreneurship and the development of occupations and in particular we should have spent much more money on the women For instance, when I used to go up as advice on reconciliation, I asked the banks, you know, why aren't you giving more loans? And they said, oh, our money is exhausted. All the loans are non-performing. I said, how much did you give to women? And not nothing was given to women in one di- division. Why? Because our structures were still male-heavy, and you know, men consume. <laughs> they take the loan and they drink. The women would have made sure that some sort of investment was done, but there was no policy on things like that. So I think there was a lot of let us say um, inadequacy with using funds properly and the west unlike india and china which gave us a lot of practical help what the west does is what they call capacity building so they give a lot of money to ngos in colombo who then have lots of seminars in very big hotels and tell each other you know how important it is to work with the people and the people get no benefits from this well you are you're referring to um, india and china and then west yeah and stating that they have been supporting throughout this conflict or post conflict situation india and china very much so both of them but there is a criticism that you know west or india and china mm. they have some other sort of interest in sri lanka the result is that now you have two sitting prime ministers okay. what do you have to say chaos in sri lanka at the moment there certainly is a lot of interference um i think one of the problems that we faced under the rajapaksa government was that relations with india which had been very good became bad uh, partly because there were people on both sides trying to destroy them uh, some of it was false you know i was talking to indian channel the other day and said you know rajapaksa is pro china and vikram singh is pro india and i said hang on they were talking about the hambantota port which has been leased to china for 99 years and i said rajapaksa built the hambantota port with chinese aid but he asked india first and india said no you know maybe for good reason maybe they didn't have the money uh but he had a agreement with china for a loan the wickmasinghe government having come in insulted china and said you know rajapaksa is bought by china and then they realized that no one else was giving them money so they actually they are the people who leased the port to china for 99 years which personally you know i'm very fond of what china has done to help sri lanka just as i'm fond of what india has done but you don't give a port for 99 years to a chinese company you know that sort of lease is unheard of so actually when the rajapaksa government sold some land outright the government the opposition complained and after that it stopped it was short term leases so i think there's a lot of hype about this the bottom line is sri lanka has to recognize that other countries help you for their own interests w- what are their interests can you tell us the well, indian or chinese interest in sri lanka at the moment well don't forget the position of sri lanka makes it of great 
use for anyone who needs to use sea routes. You know, the Hambantota port is ideally placed for refueling and so on. So it's a very good thing we built it. What we have to make sure is that it is open to everybody. Now, I think the important thing about both China and India is that they don't claim exclusive rights. You see, part of the problem is with America that feels that, you know, they should have exclusive rights. Don't allow Chinese submarines, but our submarines can come. Now, frankly, we should either allow no submarines or allow any submarine to come, but subject to rigid conditions. So in these areas, obviously, everyone will want to make use of Sri Lanka. We developed the Maptale airport, which the Rajpaksa, I think, cited in the wrong place and didn't develop infrastructure. But it can be rescued. It does serve a purpose, a second airport in Sri Lanka. And what we should do is work with a lot of countries to, let's say, allow for investment zones, not give anyone exclusive rights. That is really the problem that we have, that some people want exclusivity. If you remember way back in the 80s, when we first had problems with India, India was furious with us because we were giving America exclusive rights, including, funnily enough, because now we know these are so unnecessary. Do you mean that the current unrest in Sri Lanka is the result of Chinese or Indian interests? No, 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 not at all. The current unrest in Sri Lanka is because of politicians being unable how to How long it will go, you know? How, how can a country have two prime ministers and such long well, time? The problem is that the former prime minister did not go to the Supreme Court to challenge his dismissal, maybe because he knew it was potentially legal. Now the problem is the president dissolved parliament and said the easiest thing is have another election, let's then the people decide. But the opposition has challenged that. We should get the result pretty soon. If an election is held, that will probably be the quickest solution. If an election is not held, I think all sides will have to compromise. But, you know, our politicians are very greedy for power. They want exclusive power. For instance, one of the reasons we are in this mess is we have a presidential constitution. Vikramasinghe tried to adjust the constitution by stealth to hand power to the prime minister, even though the Supreme Court said you can't do that without a referendum. So he should have realized he's prime minister, he's not president, but he wanted to exercise presidential powers. Now, in the present context, obviously the Western nations would like Vikramasinghe to continue. India probably would prefer Vikramasinghe, but I think the Indian Foreign Ministry, which sometimes is less prejudiced than Indian politicians, mm -hmm. will understand that a more balanced solution is what they need. Well, uh, Mr. Vijay Singh, uh, let us let's talk about the education as well. What is the impact of political unrest into education and how should the post-conflict countries prepare for better education? Well, one thing is we don't have an education policy. Secondly, uh, whatever one government does is changed by the other government because of personalities. I'll give you a simple example. When we had President Kumaratunga, she was very keen on starting English medium and it was entrusted to me. I started English medium in government schools. But then Vikram Singer became Prime Minister and tried to stop it. And, uh, you know, I asked him, are you opposed to English medium? He said, no, 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 you know, but don't do it now because I have no time. So I said, but you don't, you're not needed. <laughs> you know, anyone can do it. You just have to have a good Minister of Education and he had a good Minister of Education. So policies change and we don't have continuity. When I was in Parliament, I tried very hard to get three new acts. For instance, our Education Act is based on a British ordinance. We haven't had an act for 50 years. The Higher Education Act is based on an act in the 70s. That has to change because one of the reasons I came to Nepal is we had a discussion on education as a public good. And in South Asia. In South Asia, all over. And we are all facing this dilemma that while we all agree that free education is necessary, and it is the obligation of the state to provide good education free of charge to everybody. We also have to recognize that as more and more education is needed and more training and more skills training, the state can't finance it all. So there has to be room for private education. How do you make sure that private education doesn't become parasitic on the state, that it becomes a creative measure in its own right? So what we need to do and even some people against private education said, but let it experiment, is we need to develop systems 
that ensure good basic education for everybody, but also skilling, because it has to lead to jobs, not academia. Now, I was reading some of your Nepalese textbooks. They're far too academic. You know, the poor kids can't understand anything. I don't think the teachers can understand some of the language used. And in one state school, they had English medium at, pri at primary level. That seems to me absurd. What are your key suggestions improving these options? Well, ideas? very simply, I, I gave 10 suggestions based, no, six, based on our discussions. One of them is clear directive about compulsory education and in mother tongue at primary level. That doesn't mean you have to stop private schools doing English, but they must be under certain conditions. Secondly, the need to have skilling so that your what you're actually teaching is not academia, but how to think, how to act, how to respond. Then creativity. You know, we need to make sure that children have extracurricular activities. They can interact with each other. They don't look at a book and try to answer you know, examination questions. Then I think it's particularly important that we actually make sure that training is available in schools as well for vocations. You know, I think you need to have, make sure that people can go into jobs respectably, uh, like, uh, you know, building trade, the service sector, health sector, all those we should, tourism, there should be proper training from school onwards so that people can opt for those if they're not academic. I think in too many countries like in South Asia, and this is part of the British legacy, there's an assumption that education is exams and university degrees, but education should be education for life. So I, I uh, gave my six suggestions. That's really interesting, Mr. Bijay Shinga. What should countries like ours, Nepal, Sri Lanka, or any other post-conflict countries do so to address the aspirations of the sufferers, I mean the conflict victims, in relation to education, their children have appropriate access to education services as rights. Well, I think that's an absolute right. Free education for everybody must be done. But in order to deliver it, you also have to have good training of principals and teachers, principals in particular. I, we were shown as part of our program a delightful film called Deception about Education. I gather it's very popular. And it shows all the flaws, the politicization of education. In education should be a public good, not a political good for the politicians. But you also need to strengthen the principles. You need to make sure that they can have a discipline school, where the teachers actually feel obliged not to teach, but to make sure the students learn. There's a big difference between allowing your students to learn we also need to move to what I call problem-based learning, you know, where the students are asked to decide. I remember ages ago in Sri Lanka, they asked me to do a teacher's guide. And then the Minister of Education got very annoyed with me and said, no, no, we need another one. I said, why? They said, because you don't give the answers, you only give the questions. <laughs> and I said, that's the whole point of education. It is to ask questions, but give guidelines for students to work together to develop the answers themselves. You see, you also need to develop the, the leadership skills even in students. So you do give a lot of project work. You know, we had an excellent delegate from Bhutan who talked about greening, a green school, where you give students an environmental issue and they'll build your curriculum in a lot of subjects around that, whether it's mathematics, whether it's science, whether it's health, so that the students start thinking. And believe me, the more you give students, the better they do. If you restrict their imagination, their capacity to work together, they become, you know, corrupted. They start thinking that there is a right answer which only the teacher knows. That is how you create a, 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 a generation that will look up to false leaders. You have to create generations that question, but question rationally, not just react, but give reasons for their reaction. And the girls and boys working together are the best answer to this. Well, could you also reflect from the Sri Lanka, the post-conflict, you know, development, particularly education strategies that Nepal could learn? Well, let me give you a simple example. In a lot of these schools, for instance, I did a lot of work up in the north. I used to go to every divisional secretariat. They were all complaining. Why? Because their teachers came from the capital, Jaffna. And... They come on Monday mornings late, they leave on Fridays. But what we need to do is create cadres of local teachers 
who live in the village. And I still remember when we started exporting garments. The Jawadan government had garment factories in the free trade zone near Colombo. The next president insisted on the garment factories being in villagers. And Colombo businessmen said, oh, you know, he's destroying us, he's making us move. But the girls working were so happy, they could live at home. Similarly, you must create teachers. And you can do that, you know, in any divisional vocational training centre. You can start training teachers to teach at primary level. Then these poor kids will not be without teachers. Now, this is an ideal thing we should have done with the former combatants. You know, given them the basic skills, the ones who were literate, and, you know, we had plenty because one of the big things Sri Lanka did is soon after the conflict, we trained them in the former combatants in the rehabilitation camps to sit for public exams. We could easily have given them vocational qualifications in basic primary teaching because it's the primary foundation that kids need. And that is much easier if you have good teachers. You don't need elaborate materials. You don't need the sort of thing I saw in Nepal which is grade 5 textbooks that even I can't understand the English. You want to make sure that the kids have fun and facilitating. Um, I, I tried just before I stopped being chairman of the Vocational Training uh, Commission to have what I called a junior facilitator. And you can easily train village kids at the age of 16 to leave school and go and work in the primary. And they learn together. So that is very easy. Well, very interesting issues coming out, but we are coming to the end of the show, uh, Mr. Vijay Singh. Do you have any final thoughts linking post-conflict situation into, you know, preparation of better education strategies in the region very quickly? Well, I think very simply it would make a lot of good sense if our South Asian countries work together. And particularly Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, because in a sense, our problems are different from those in India. India, unlike all of us, actually worked towards quick excellence in education and has top quality education that's very good, even in the public sector, like the IITs. Of course, they have bigger problems, you know, because they have such a mass population and such a diffuse country. So we could work together. But I think our problems and yours and those from what I gathered in Pakistan and Bangladesh are very similar. And I think a common strategy, maybe even common English language textbooks, you know, then economies of scale could be got over so that we should really develop that sort of strategy. And one of my great sadnesses is how defunct SARC has become, you know, because of political problems between India and Pakistan. The rest of us don't have a regional association. And it's high time India and Pakistan banged their heads together and said, look, we can fight on other things. Let's SARC develop as a development organization. I hope that happens. Well, uh, Mr. Vijay Shinga, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed for having me here. The audience, time now to wrap up the show. Keep watching us. See you next week. Namaste.